Quiet on set. Picture is up. All right, roll sound. Rolling. Roll cameras. Cams rolling. And three, two. Hey everybody, what's going on? And welcome to Hank's Think Tank. Got a great show for you here today. Guess what? It's not politics for a change. Yay! And yeah, I'm super happy about that. Got Mark Hogan on my left. Howdy, everybody. Mark had a nice breakfast this morning. Oh my He's been talking God. about it for the pa- about the past 30 minutes. What'd you have, Mark? Let us know. <laughs> well, I made my own concoction last night, so I had it for leftovers this morning. Nice. Noodles. I had noodles. <laughs> I had a can of red beans. And I had some greens, and they all went together, and they needed a little Tony Chachere. Isn't this fascinating? A little butter. And uh, Rocky had some. He liked it, too. Wow. I had it for breakfast. Power breakfast. Carbs, vegetables, everything all in one pot. I saved a little for you. That's okay. Jackie, bring it out in a minute. I had eggs and toast in your standard breakfast, but I get up. Boring. All right, guys, so today we've got Chuck Sweeney in with us today. He's with Marathon Music Group, and he is an artist management and booking agent. And uh, good to have you aboard, Chuck. How's it going? Uh, It's going great, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come out and talk to you. We're glad to have you here, man. No problem. Um, Chuck also, and I just got to mention, he's a band member as well. And uh, we had Eric uh, Hancock. Hancock in with reverb cartel this is about a year ago i guess mm-hmm. that we had eric in I, and, uh, and i saw that uh, plays in the same band yeah, yeah. yeah eric's that, a phenomenal reverb. guitar player he's a great guitar player i'd love to have him mine. back in and uh, we, we need to have him back have him back in and let him plug up yeah for sure yeah yeah because i think he was just he was unamplified man i don't know we'll get all you, this gear you, you know you yeah, guys cool. need to come to uh uh Hempstead, I guess it is, the Thirsty Parrot. We're playing out there on May 28th. In Hempstead, Texas? Mm-hmm. Wow, that's a good long May 28th. What day is that? Saturday? That's a Saturday. Six to nine, so okay. it's not too late. I'll for, give you, I'll for give the you older, a ride. For the older guys at the table that need to get to bed early, you, we'll, we'll be we'll finished at about nine o'clock. Yeah, you'll cool. Be able to get I'll home. turn into a pumpkin at 9.15, there you go. so that's perfect. But, uh, All right. Well, Chuck, um, we were talking a little bit before we started rolling the cams, and the conversation was great. I kind of wanted to cover all that again. Sure. So uh, before you became an artist management and booking agent, mm-hmm. you worked for Comcast, I guess. Or well, it was with Time Warner Cable. Time you may Warner remember. Cable, remember yeah. it was Time Warner Cable about 10 years or so ago? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I came. I moved down from uh, Ohio when I was a teenager and started school in San Antonio. And... Uh, uh, passionate about music had the biggest record collection in the dormitory and all that stuff found a buddy and we started playing guitars together and had a cover band in our 20s but when i got out of school i went into the corporate world and and in telecom and a sales job so i'm kind of the core sales guy at heart and kind of never met a stranger love going up talking to people and uh Part of that's training, but part of it's natural too. It's mm-hmm. just being comfortable going and talking to people about something new and exciting that you yeah. have, for for example. Or you got to be cut that, out for that. Yeah, so I, I yeah. ended up making it to Time Warner Cable. I was the VP for their business to business department, and uh, had a suit on every day, drove mm. through rush hour traffic to mm. get to work on time, and Ugh. had a lot of people in my department depending on me to be there, and did all that. I. It sounds very soul killing. Oh you know? man! Just getting up at the same time and then every I day. Put, I I worked there for four or five years and built up this department. I kind of felt, I kind of feel like it's your baby, you know, because oh, yeah. you were there. And then, out of the blue, hey, just so you know, Comcast is buying the Houston market, and uh, we all appreciate all the time you've put in and. <laughs> And have a nice day. Have a nice day. Here's your package. Hey, turn in your badge. So, oh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in my life back then. Then I just, I kind of thought, you know, uh, I'd go to an interview and uh, I'd be really qualified for it. But I knew I'd have to put a suit on and, and go into the city and all that stuff. And I realized, you know, I don't, I just don't want to do that anymore. Like, yeah. there's nothing appealing about it anymore. And so uh, I, I decided, and I have a, I have a beautiful uh, daughter who was a, in middle school at the time, and I wanted to be more present in her life. And I thought, 
you know, I need to figure out something I can do where I don't have to go in the city. And I also didn't want to wear a suit anymore. Jeans and a T-shirt is kind of comfy for that's me. That's the way so to go. That's the way to go. So I stumbled into an opportunity <clears throat> to go work at a at a recording studio mm-hmm. to be around music again. I never imagined I'd be working in the music industry, but I was I was looking for job postings, anything having to do with sales and marketing, because I've got mm-hmm. a good background in that. As long as I didn't have to go into a data center or or work in an office building, I, I was going to take it. I want to be part of the community was really important to me. So um, I wanted to be, uh, you know, not driving into downtown Houston. I live right. in Sugar Land. I wanted to be there. And I turned out the recording studios right in Sugar Land. And I, they were looking for somebody with a sales and marketing background to bring professional mm-hmm. um, musicians in to, to record. Now, was it a, a niche studio? Did they do a certain type of music or just anything that would walk? In they're the really room? good. They're really they good. They, the they, they, yeah, their, their, uh, their forte was like uh, Americana and country and soul and, okay. uh, you know, um, not really any um, R and B or hip hop or any of that stuff. This mm-hmm. is, they, they put out as these are all like acoustic instruments, like, a, yes, electric guitars, but, mm-hmm recording acoustically not creating digital um tracks you know okay. that kind of a thing and they're really really good at what they did but they didn't have enough business they didn't have enough artists so my job description was to go out and hear a lot of live music <laughs> and talk to a lot of musicians about recording their next what a drag job wow yeah. i was just like man yeah. where do i sign Should've up left for that? that gig yeah really so uh man i just felt it was just the perfect thing for me at that point uh to go do that and I, I i was there about three years or so mm-hmm. and uh, there were great people to uh, work for work with they produced really great music and i met a lot of really great artists i began to learn what the texas music scene was about mm-hmm. and uh, texas does have a hell of a music we've scene, got a it? really great music scene oh, yeah. down here and uh, te- yeah it's and, foundational and, yeah, and, it really and, is and particularly you know country is at the top of the pecking order in terms of of uh uh, consumer demand, let's call mm-hmm. it. Uh, back when when we were teens, it was rock was king, you know. So I right. went to you name it, the Who, the Rolling Stones, all that stuff. That that was king. Uh, and now you know, country supplanted that. Country is really the top selling product right now in the music industry, and uh, Texas has its own brand or genre it's own flavor <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more of a flavor i think it's yeah. a flavor of country music they're very true to so. some of the country traditions of fiddle and pedal steel and, mm-hmm. and again acoustic instruments and uh, uh there's a there's a lot of melding of rock and other influences and in what comes out but they're much more traditional i would i guess would you'd, you'd say yeah and uh but anyway so i i spent a time at the studio I brought a lot of artists in to record with them and I learned so much from the producer and the engineer about um, how to be success how these artists can find or secure success in the industry it's a tough industry to be in yes, as you right. might imagine and uh, I began to realize that a lot of the artists that we produce a really great record for the artist and the artist would just say like now what do I do this is the best thing I've ever made what should I do next? And the producer right. had a lot of great ideas, but the producer did not want to be involved in anything that happened after the record was made. He wanted to spend his talent and resources on making the next great record. So I kind of gravitated towards, well, geez, you, you need to find a good radio promoter. I'll go f- find out what radio promotion's about and go talk to some radio promoters. And, oh, you need publicity? I guess I should call some Texas publicists and see what they do for a living and how much it costs and all that so gradually I, I began helping the artists that were making music there and then um about four years ago i realized hey i think i know enough now about the industry that i could just devote all of my time towards helping artists succeed and because of my corporate background i also understood how pnls worked and how mm-hmm. capital you know any startup business needs capital right and uh starting a music career is no different yeah. like you can't, can't build a house without a foundation so. right and uh you may have the best ice cream in the world 
But if you don't have the capital to buy a freezer to put it in and a cash register to collect <laughs> yeah, the money, that's for sure. <laughs> you're not uh, getting off the ground. So you need uh, you need some kind of infusion of capital to make a really great record, probably uh, one or two music videos, hire a radio promoter to get it heard on radio, and radio is still relevant. Um, yeah, of course it is. It's very yeah. relevant. It's very, you know, everything about, the, you know how they say politics is all local, is mm -hmm. that correct? Well, so is so is a lot of stuff that the artists do, is that the, the, the radio stations are really well connected to their local communities, mm -hmm. and those communities include the venues that the artists need to play. And in. so they've had to be because of the change in the music industry. That's correct. You know, after Napster and all that, when all that happened, and people stopped making money off sales as far as records and things like that, and everybody had to go live, it changed a lot even for the radio stations. That's correct. You know, because they had to then form alliances with their community and with local venues right. and things like that, or they were going to die. And a lot of them didn't make it. As, as so. I explained to a lot of the artists that I work with and talk to, and if they, if they're if they're interested in, in any of this stuff, as I say, you know, you got to kind of look at it this way. The, the venue in that town, whether you're in, uh, you know, Magnolia or uh, uh, Conroe or anywhere, Midland, San Angelo, whatever, that venue is trying to draw people to hear live music. Mm -hmm. And they're going to leverage that local radio station to let the community know that there is a artist coming well the artists that they want to hire ideally are being played on the radio station right like why would you hire why would you give preference to an artist whose music isn't even on the radio so they're going to they're more likely to hire an artist whose music is getting played on the radio so how do you get music played on the radio well you hire a radio promoter who happens to have be on a first name basis with all the important texas radio stations across the state and beyond because there's there's texas radio being played in other markets outside of texas colorado springs right. and kansas and stuff so anyway so there's a real synergy between the artists the state the radio station and the local venue oftentimes mm -hmm. and uh and you begin to realize the more t time you spend in the industry, you begin to see the dot. You know, it's just a bunch of dots, and then you begin yeah. to see how they connect. And such and all a that different stuff. landscape than it yeah. was back in yeah, the seventies. Really you know, so it's crazy. And yes, Spotify is important, and oh, yeah. Apple, like it's all of that. Even so, social media now. I've, social media. I've noticed really a lot on Facebook. I'm starting to see a lot more artists on Facebook, and their ads are more professional, mm -hmm. and their their little media pieces are a lot more professional. So. They're starting to catch on. They're figuring it That's out. Right. You know? And they, they watch it. You know, it's really smart. They watch what the other ones are doing, the ones that mm -hmm. are having success. And then now with the technology we have in our phones, our iPhones or whatever, our Androids and all that stuff, mm -hmm. you can actually produce a lot of really great content without oh, it's crazy. On, on, on these devices. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it's – anyway, so it's really rewarding for me to be able to work with young – artists who are all way more talented than I am in music. I mean, I've been a hobby musician my whole life. I, I right. play in a cover band, I play guitar and keyboards and all that stuff. But these are young art kids I work with, and they're not all kids, but I, they, for me, because I'm sure, older. Sure, I got you. Um, it's just, they're so phenomenal and they deserve a shot. Um, you know, most of them, maybe all of them that I know, they don't want to be the next, uh, Bruce Springsteen or Taylor Swift or whatever they don't you know they don't necessarily want global fame isn't mm -hmm. what they're, they're they would like to be able to make a car payment uh, a house payment if they have kids they'd like to be able to put the kids through school and take their spouses out for a nice dinner every right. other weekend they just want the same things we do and it's hard to get that in the music industry if you don't have a well thought out plan to right. execute so yeah and fame can be a real problem also mm -hmm. i wouldn't want to be and famous i don't think anybody yeah. really understands what an industry of the music business really is you know everything that you just broke down behind the scenes before they ever get up on stage with their guitar right. yeah and that's a single prong it's a multi-pronged i mean there's so much to it it's crazy oh yeah. the prongs are just so, everywhere yeah yeah, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about the recording industry also, mm -hmm. because you had mentioned it a little while ago. And 
and I think it's interesting that that whole industry had to morph also and and try to keep up with the times, especially sure. now when you've got guys that are literally making music that gets produced in their bedroom on a laptop. Mm-hmm. Pro so, Tools. Yeah. So what do you think of the viability of studios? And, and do your guys still use studios? Do you still recommend your artists go to studios? Yes, because as, as great as the technology is, at the end of the day, it's the person – using the technology that's going to have the most dramatic impact on the, the finished product. Mm-hmm. I agree. So it's touch. So you know? when, when I'm working with a young artist and talking about helping them raise money for their next single or EP or album or whatever, and we can talk about the difference between those three things. But when we talk about them getting something I would call radio ready mm-hmm. material, um, something that's worth sending to radio. If you send something that's mediocre, right? Or not really well produced. Well, they're going to hear that right or away. Sounds, yeah. Or sounds manufactured because there's a lot of that. A lot of that out yeah. now. You're spending you're spending money with a radio promotion to send something to radio that's probably going to fail because those, particularly the radio station programmers, they listen to good music every day as they're as they're that's what they do right so even more than you and i they're going to hear uh i don't think i should put this in my in rotation because i i don't think it was it's not made well enough so you got to make sure that i would rather have an artist make one phenomenal single than a whole album's worth of pretty good music but we had to cut a few corners Mm -hmm. you know is that one thing that you do like almost like well they're artists so they should produce art that they will be proud of for the rest of their lives every time they produce something Mm -hmm. um even when they're gone it's going to live on and you don't do that by cutting corners or now i'm not saying there's anything wrong with producing music at home but i just think you're at a disadvantage when uh you do that instead of hiring a professional producer Mm -hmm. who's got maybe years or even decades of experience making really great music and when uh, in a really great studio and when i talk to artists about that process um all the stuff by the way was told to me so like i learned this stuff over the the, the last several years of working in industry i don't claim to have thought up any of this stuff i'm just sharing with you what i learned from other people is that i don't take them to to see a studio it's it, the space isn't what's important. It's the right. producer. It's the person that's going to be working with you. Are mm-hmm. they going to help you take a like a raw diamond? Right. Is the song that you've written and the talent of your voice and maybe your guitar playing or whatever it is you bring to the table. How do they take that and how do they how do they help you produce a finished product that is better than you thought it could be is better than you thought it could be lightning in a jar lightning in a jar and then all of a sudden you take that to radio and boom it goes viral everybody falls in love with it Mm -hmm. and a lot of people that listen to music don't even know why they can tell you i love this song more than this song and they can't necessarily tell you why this song sonically sounds better to them like they Mm -hmm. can't say well the I can really hear the kick in the bass line up in this song. They just know it sounds better mm-hmm. and they connect right. with it. They like the way it makes them feel. They may like the way it makes them sure. feel. And a really good producer <clears throat> knows how to capture that and produce that. So, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. agree. So. Plus, you just got to have a good room and you got to have good gear. Mm-hmm. And you can't always get that in the bedroom on a laptop. You can't. You know. Acoustics are so. really important. Oh, yeah, and big time. studios are, uh, you've got a beautiful studio here. It's obviously got the right kind of acoustics to make a really great podcast and we're working with it yeah, yeah. yeah it's so. built for voice that's yeah. for sure there's yeah. also a big debate uh, talking about the recording process as i hear artists debate about this stuff too spotify which is the largest uh, digital stream uh, streaming provider dsp mm-hmm. uh has a huge market share apple um apple play i guess it's called now apple right music behind them. Apple is right music, behind it yeah is right behind him. And mm-hmm. then there's others. There's Amazon and Google. And then a lot of people yeah. get their music on YouTube. Um, right. Because you can put 
songs up on YouTube without any video and still listen to mm-hmm. make playlists on YouTube. These are all different ways to stream and they tend and Spotify does this for sure is they promote the idea of singles. It's all about singles. Mm-hmm. And they playlist people kids nowadays as they say mm-hmm. um, they consume their music in playlists. They don't listen to for the most part, don't listen to albums right. beginning to end right. like we maybe we used to when we were kids. So I've heard a lot of um, young know, young people in the industry go like, "Well, I don't understand why we why we need an album because everything's single driven. I'm just going to make all singles." Well, unfortunately, like in many areas, many businesses, you've got to serve a lot of different masters. So that's true. Spotify wants you the the consumers on Spotify and Spotify themselves, they really want you delivering a new single every couple months. Right. Yeah, they're looking yeah. for consistency for yeah. sure. Uh, and uh, they don't really care if you send an album out. Mm-hmm. But and then they're... if that's true, then why are the, I tell the young artists or the, the, the artists that are just getting started, if that's true, that it's just about singles, then why are all the top grossing touring artists that you can think of name many of them i'm sure there's an exception out there somewhere but they're still coming out with albums Mm -hmm. every couple years if you go look albums well the really thing is you got to serve both masters yes you've got to send out a new single but you also as they say fake it before you make it if you want to be respected as as a pro you're expected to deliver a body of work a lot right. of a lot of periodicals, publications, they don't want to write stories about singles. Mm-hmm. It'd be a very short story, right? <laughs> yeah, in a lot of cases, it would. Yeah. You know? So Rolling Stone Country wants to do an expose about an artist. They want to do it when the artist is releasing a new album, and they want to get the album a month ahead of everybody else, mm-hmm. and they want to listen to it, and they want to write about the album and tell about everything that's happening on that album. It's a great story. And it helps to drive live sales, and it, I mean, it, it does a lot. Correct. The album is the core. Yeah, and that you know? one single may draw somebody to Spotify to listen to you, and if you can have a, an album there, they may end up listening to the whole album, which is mm-hmm. great. So there's ways we try to serve both. So I tell, I say for... Cost-wise, going in a recording studio, almost all the studios will do this. If you'll go in there and spend the money to record eight or ten songs, that anything eight or more is considered an album's mm-hmm. worth. Anything less than that's considered an EP. Right. Um, if you if you can spend enough money to maybe knock out eight to ten songs at one uh, project over a week or two of recording, um, they'll give you a better price cost per song. Mm-hmm. But if you just go there and do one song at a time. By the time you make 10 songs, you may have spent 50% more or double what you would have if you just recorded all at once. So if you can afford to raise the money and go in there and record 10 songs, then I'd say it's like, go in there, you'll save money on the cost per song. We can release one song at a time every two to three months. About every four to six months, one of those songs should go to radio. Let's try to keep a song working its way up or down the chart at all times, the Texas charts. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we'll package it as an album towards the tail end when we're down to like we only have a few more songs left to put out as singles. Let's release it as an album. And now you haven't you've staked the fact that you've got a, an album worth of music there that was all recorded together. So it, it's deservedly considered an album sonically it was right. done at the same time time was it's, it's not little... a compilation of singles in the sense that right. you're going to have the same musicians on the album likely um, maybe a few color instruments aren't on every song but the, mm-hmm. the drummer the bass player the singer the guitar players right. they're all came together to make this album in the same place with the same producer and it's going to it's going to be have, be a cohesive collection of music it belongs on an album you don't have to put them all out at once put them out as singles and then, so it kind of serves both masters so, so those are some of the things that i talk to artists when i first start working with them is what is the plan and then the other thing is video has become so critical now like we it really is we're like everything yeah. we almost have to watch like we're driving around in cars and i'm not watching videos while i'm driving but my wife's watching video while i'm driving on mm-hmm. her phone because you can consume video now anywhere 
anytime, any place mm-hmm. right. on our phone. So it really helps if you can, and the cost to produce videos has come way down. You can make really, as I'm sure you've seen, some really phenomenal quality videos. Because the majority of it's in post. That's yeah. right. It's yeah. all done in post. So yeah. you lay down that music as the bed and you go out and shoot a bunch of stuff and you lay it on top. And if you get a, if you get a good, you know, you can spend a few hundred dollars or you can spend several thousand dollars. But mm-hmm. And there's different kinds of videos, lyric videos and you know, you can make a video just moving still images right. around, or you can get a fully produced video that maybe has actors in it and shot at two or three different locations with special lighting and mm-hmm. and effects and everything, and spend a lot of money on it. But yeah, you need to put some money aside and and try to deliver some video content with the music that's going on. So are you finding you're having to go to different video or different media companies for video than you would the recording studio or is it recording studio handling? It all? I've got a few. So like that, that's one of the, one of the values I think I bring to a lot of the artists I work with is cause I've been doing this for a few years now. I have in my phone, so to speak, my Rolodex is I've got several sure. video producers. I've got a lot of record producers, radio promoters, publicists, um, that all come with a different level of experience, Mm -hmm. um, a different cost base, you know, cost structure. And it's trying to help the artist budget for all this stuff up front Mm -hmm. and figure out like, what is the right thing to do? So like we spent a lot of money on that video lot for the last single. If the budget doesn't allow us to spend that kind of money, maybe we just go with the lyric video. Now we can get that done for a few hundred and we'll use Mm -hmm. this, this guy does great lyric videos. This guy does the great big fully produced videos and um, okay. get out there. And uh, I've got a lot of that software on my computer. I've got a DAW for recording, multi-tracking, and I have uh, the Adobe Suite. I have the Premiere Pro video editing stuff. Okay. But you know what? I'd love it. That's fun to dabble with. It's a lot of work. But man, that is so time consuming. I would love to be able to be the artist's video producer, but I don't have a lot of experience with it. And it would take me so much time to get up to speed. It's a long learning curve. It's a really long learning curve. So I really appreciate what they do. And uh, that's just one of the things in the mix. Okay. So how many artists do you represent? So uh, uh, right now I have uh, nine artists. If you visit my uh, website, marathonmusicgroup.com. Okay. You'll see on my, I don't have a complicated website. I have a homepage with nine artists on it. Um, there's a little link at the bottom. You can pull up what we call their one sheet, which has their yeah. bio links yeah. to their video. It's really well laid out. You pick out uh, yeah. someone you want to look at. They've got a PDF, pops up. They've yeah. all got a video down there that you can uh, check them out. Yeah. I'm all about helping those artists it's not about me it's about those artists so i showcase those nine artists on my website and i have i can't get into the details of every one but i have different levels of of every artist is so different you know let's face it sure yeah so they have different sets of needs expectations um they're at different phases in their career i have an artist that's just starting out um i have an artist that's been doing this uh for years um and uh each of the, there, I try to follow industry standards in terms of what booking agents do and managers do. And I have some of the artists do all their booking, they're under management with me. It's kind of a long-term commitment for both parties. We both okay. have a vested interest in what's going to happen two and three years from now. That tends to be the management side of the house where you're doing really strong. You're doing day-to-day tactical stuff, but you're also doing really strategic planning. You get involved in every aspect, generally. Right. Everything from, it starts with raising funds to create content, um, whether it's re- music recording or video or whatever. Um, and uh, it goes into into finding the right vendors to help you produce that stuff to all that. And then uh, thinking long-term about the artist's career. And then the other thing is the booking part. Uh, booking, you know, performing nowadays. It used to be record sales a mm-hmm. long time ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, were, Which was a different animal altogether. So, so mm-hmm. there's a really, yeah. H, I want to say it was HBO had this series a few years back called, I think it was called Vinyl was the name of the series. And they, they stopped it after one season. But I loved that show. I guess it didn't connect with people that weren't 
in our you know mm-hmm. line of work. But it was about it was a it was almost like a madman madman. Remember okay. that thing? It was yeah. that kind yeah. of a thing where Mad it was Men. a drama yeah. taking place inside a record label in the nineteen seventies. Oh wow! So I'll have to check that. Back out. Yeah. then, yeah. back then the record label, the the money, the golden goose was the 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 artist that could produce a platinum album runaway hit and everything runaway hit that album if it sold enough albums man so what they would do is they would contract like maybe 20 artists would be on the record label Mm -hmm. and the record label had a producer or maybe multiple producers they had a recording studio they owned the manufacturing facility that printed the albums mm-hmm. Lathe, they yeah. they had a photographer on staff they had a publicist on staff they had a radio promoter on staff they had all these departments and they would bring these artists in that were just raw talent mm-hmm. and they'd tell them what to wear and they'd take them in the studio and you know they'd record the album sometimes they'd get session musicians to come in if some of the band members weren't good enough and they would produce right. this really great con- the whole thing and then they would send they'd have booking agents and they the artists would go on tour not because the tour itself paid any money, but going out on tour would generate record sales. Right, right. Promotion if the artist the did, album, yeah. If the artist didn't go on tour, you wouldn't sell any albums. So you right. got to get the artist on tour and you got to get hire a manager for the, or tour manager for the artist to keep them sober and in the van for the next stop and all that stuff. And uh, so so the, that vinyl was all about that whole thing. Of course, there's all that drama about romance and all the other crazy sure. stuff that yeah. happens in a drama. But I thought it was a really interesting peek <clears throat> into what was happening record label. Well, what happened was with Napster and then uh, uh, MP3s and, mm-hmm. and streaming, uh, Apple Music came out. You could buy a song for a dollar twenty nine or whatever. Right. All of a sudden, nobody was going into the record store buying CDs and albums anymore. Yeah, the record stores started to die, and and the industry changed. Sad, really. Yeah, what were some of the big record you stores know? you guys used to go to when you were? Oh, Her, well, H and H, H and H, H and H Music, um, Cactus, Cactus Records yeah. and Tape, Hastings, Hastings, yeah. yeah. Wow, a lot of the Those yeah Hastings. Good, remember yeah. Hastings? I think Cactus is still open. The one in Houston. Yeah, I think it's still open, but you can go in there and buy vintage used you know vintage uh, old i like to go to antique places you know and i'm looking for old military and whatever yeah. and, and uh they'll always have a booth the record guy and uh you can buy thumb through the albums like the old days and, and everything and of course you don't know how scratched up they are you can kind of look at them but yeah. they go for about five bucks a pop see i'm not even after the vinyl i want the album covers yeah, yeah. The old that's album the way covers. it was back you, in back old in the album day. Covers are going for big dollars now. Yeah, that's right. You know, back in the yeah, day, you got a want. great yeah. big old thing. Well, like, well, it might even have a poster in it. You remember <laughs> Sheets and Shogs Big Bamboo big, big, had a paper in it, <laughs> but you had all of this stuff <laughs> that to read. Last and it, long. it took up some space, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, uh, it was great. So that was the business model back then, and then when all this streaming happened, and you didn't have to go to the record store and buy an album or a CD, you could just. Mm-hmm. buy it online and now you can stream it you don't even have to buy it you just get right. a subscription and hear all that stuff the whole thing got flipped upside but those record labels what they did was they dropped all the artists that weren't making any money for them right and focused on only the big artists that was the dawn of the independent artist all those artists had to become independent and figure it out for themselves the other thing the record label did is they sh- they shed all those departments yeah. That, like, why are we owning a recording studio and a producer and a radio promoter and a publicist and a manufacturing facility and a sales guy to go sell albums to all the record stores and all that infrastructure? They just shed all that. And they mm-hmm. pretty much became what we think of as like a bank. So they, um, they will, a record label will pick up an artist that's already capable of of generating a lot of streaming revenue right and uh, they will they'll come up with an, a, a financial model that says well if we if we take over them we can maybe boost their sales by 20 or 30 percent next year and mm-hmm. that's how we're gonna make our money but they're not gonna pick up a rarely ever pick up a 
unknown artist who has potential to be somebody someday. That's too much risk. Right. Yeah. And all those people that used to work at the label, the radio promoters and the publicists and the salespeople, they didn't die. They just went out and hung up their own shingle now. So like a lot of those people are still around and there's a younger generation of those people now, but you can, they're all, everybody's independent, but you still need all those people and all those functions are still important. But now the revenue driver isn't the sale of the music. It's the touring. So I, I don't know this. I'm, and that's changed a lot too. So there's more venues where you can go hear live music now. Mm -hmm. And there's, more ways to advertise shows now than there used to be and uh so the re the revenue now is all through touring it's flipped upside down so mm -hmm. you you're really producing music and content videos and singles and albums and all that and getting it out there so that people will show up to your show mm -hmm. so you can sell more tickets it's the exact opposite got to play live now so so you got to play live so yeah. um yeah so that uh uh that, that's a major transformation. So now you're talking about the artists on my roster, kind of, you know, you can't get away from the fact that the booking is the driver. It's the shows. Like if there's no shows, there's no money right. to make the records. So uh, I recently added a booking agent to my staff named Carly Evans, who's really great. She happens to be up in Colorado Springs and she, has something like 30 years in radio in radio um she was somebody i've known for years because she was spinning some of my artist music up there in colorado springs and i'd send an artist up there our radio promoter jen would send an artist up there to on radio tour to see some of the stations up that part of the country and carly would also often help us find a a local venue for the artist to perform in while they're up there on their radio tour doing their in-studio interviews kind of like this right and uh she wanted to try something different so she's coming on board i'm giving her some training and she's picking it up really fast and she's going to help she's going to help i'm building basically i'm in the phase now where i feel really comfortable in the last few years of engaging all the venues in texas there's still a lot i, I i'm not fully engaged with but i mm -hmm. pretty much have texas mapped out and the, so are you booking some of the larger venues now or, or are they still small venues or um yes i'm working my way up to the the bigger the real true what you call concert halls so yeah uh, it's hard to do because now that has to become a production you know we're going to be able you, to fill them up yeah and, and if you look at pop music now i mean even manufactured music it's all about having a whole bunch of people on stage doing the same dance you know, a lot of smoke, a lot of mirrors, and manufactured music playing in the background. Well, and you got some fine chick with a headset. Well, you know, I mean, that's, yeah. think about it, that's what it's become. If you want to listen to good music, you got to go to a smaller venue and you got to hear a band that's, true. You that's know, plugged in. That's true. You know, that has uh, an I'm not and, casting, you know, shade on the great Toyota Center in downtown Houston, but I don't go to. As much as I love music and going to live concerts, I don't go to arena uh, shows anymore um, because the acoustics are so bad. Well, I like to. Yeah. I don't see the sense in <clears throat> spending all that money and going all that trouble to go to a really big show and then watch the show on the giant screens they have up behind the artist and the mm. artist looks like a little ant <laughs> down on the stage i'm like amen yeah. and, and you hear yeah. all you hear is reverberation i'm like right man, i'd i'd enjoy it more if i was at home watching a taped version of this the best story. worst show i ever saw was zz top at uh reliance center they were there i know they were there because the screen showed them <laughs> you know and they didn't sound worth a shit in reliance center because it wasn't built for that but you know and don't get me wrong, and I, sorry, ZZ Top fans, that they're not always great live, though. For some reason, I don't know why, but I've uh -oh. seen several instances uh, I think where I, they're not always great live. I think I just heard the you sound know? of some of your listeners. <laughs> That's shutting, okay. Shutting you know, down. Hey, they all know uh, me. They know yeah. I'm honest, and I'm going to say what there needs to be go. said. But back in 2000, um, when we went from 1999 to 2000, they played at... Uh, God, wasn't Hoffines Pavilion, but it was the summit when it was the old summit. Yeah. And I went that night and they were off. I mean, they were just off. They didn't sound 
they weren't the ZZ Top I was used to listening to. Really? And I realized at that point. Could you I put said, your finger on what the what the problem was? Was it an equipment problem or? I think what? everybody was really paranoid about that whole Y two K thing. You know, and they were playing near midnight. I think I think that had something to do. ZZ with it. Top were not scared. We can just throw that out of the mix, well, man. So I don't know, man. Something was wrong. Um, you know, maybe he had a bad B string or some shit. I don't well, know. Getting was, back, they were off. Getting your point you know? uh, back to your point about manufacturing music and all that. I will say that the artists I work with and the the um, the genre that I. I do most of my work in not all not all of all my artists are country artists but the mm -hmm. texas country format really is all about authentic yeah a lot of it's live still music. music so yeah. it's it's really rare i can't think of it of any texas country artist that's on tour that's working their music to texas radio and kind of in this ecosystem that would have anything pre-recorded on stage with them they're all about being an accomplished live entertainer right and it's and uh you may you're probably not going to find any brass section or or female you know the the three the trio usually over in the back mm -hmm. ba backing singers and all that they're, yeah. they're much more about being able to get to sh you know, give you a really live uh, performance. And that's not to say that the other, I'm not knocking other genres. I'm just saying, I think that that's kind of like a fundamental earmark of Texas red dirt, Americana, Texas hope it stays country that way. music. Really is, hope it stays that it, way. Is, yeah. um, is that it's really authentic and live. And I think that any artist that produces music or tours and starts incorporating any pre-produced elements into their show would be frowned on by the community that supports us. So they may have trouble getting into some of the venues that, that we're talking about mm -hmm. and, and getting their music spun on some of the stations that we're talking about. Speaking so. of uh, live and uh, performances, did they? does anybody ever do a live album type thing anymore? Because some of my favorite albums were, were live at this and yeah. that. Yeah, uh, and there's some really great ones out there. Um, you know, I'll, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, you know, there's Stoney LaRue had this really uh, huge hit, uh, Oklahoma Breakdown, um, a few years back, which was on a live album, and it just went crazy. So, mm -hmm. yeah, there is, it's a lot harder to produce good music live yeah. from the, not the artist being able to perform it because like i said these artists like really pride themselves on being able to give flawless live performances mm -hmm. without any gimmicks but the idea of capturing that yeah, micing, right. it up. micing it up properly yeah, and I, I actually try, i actually did this for <clears throat> i worked with this really great artist uh named jody booth that some of your listeners may know of jody's great and uh one of the things i wanted to do was to capture his live show is just great. Uh, his recorded music is really great, but his live shows are so great. He does he lo he has a big band format, so he has a fiddle player, pedal steel, drums, bass, as an acoustic side player. Jody's a phenomenal guitar player himself, lead guitar tele t on his Telecaster, and he's a great singer. He had great backing vocalists in the band, and he just gave a, such a great show. And I wanted to be able to show all the venues that he hadn't played at yet for what they were missing. Right. So I hired a crew and we had uh, I'll never do it this way again it was really a challenge but we had uh, everything mic'd up on stage and we had a splitter and w one set of feeds was going into a back room and I had a audio engineer back there with headphones on that I don't know if he I assume he had headphones on now I think of it and he was tracking all that but I also had another engineer doing the front of house so we wanted to have as many people there as possible and give a great show to the front of house so mm -hmm. we had really two engineers both with the same set of feeds one was trying to get a really good recording right and the one up front was trying to make it really great for the, the yeah. fans that were in the room but uh jody threw a curveball jody's uh got a, a fairly famous daughter now um lacy k booth who's really blowing up right now she was american idol a few years back and anyway he uh 
was hoping that she was was going to be able to take a break and come for that. So mm-hmm. we ended up adding another input that wasn't planned for. Um, his he brought an extra guitar player because he wanted an even bigger show, and uh, that guitar player had brought a bad cable with him. Oh no! That's all you need. And then I made the mistake of well, that ruined it on both I, ends, man. I I made the mistake of uh, hiring an opening act. Because I thought we would draw more people, and we did. We had a pretty big house, and I thought, well, if we make it a bigger show, there'd be more people. But now the engineers have two bands to to mic up, and there's a crossover, and it it all these variables we inserted into the process right. made it really, really complicated. We ended up with some really great live video, and that you can see it out on YouTube if you go look for it. But it was the mo- one of the most stressful evenings I've ever had, running around trying to get because things something would. The guy engineer in the back would say, like, I'm getting a buzz on that line. Mm-hmm. Like, you've got to stop them after the next song, and we've got to fix that buzz, or else I won't, you know, we're, we're going to be missing that other guitar right. player. And yeah, it's hard song. to get out. So, it's, so I just know from that experience <clears throat> that recording live can be really tricky. But that guitar player couldn't hear that buzz in his, in his monitor? Yeah, he, it's, I, it must have been, uh, I don't know why they could hear it in their recording booth in the back. And he didn't hear it on well, stage. Well, they could isolate it a little easier, probably. Yeah. So it's if because back there he could mute, he could he could listen to one signal at a time right. with everything else muted, and that's yeah. probably when he heard it. He was probably going down one <laughs> channel at a time, listening he to the kick drum. He heard it. He was trying to find to, it. Yeah. Listen, mm-hmm. or, or maybe he didn't hear it until he said, "I'm going to listen to the kick drum. I'm going to listen to the snare. I'm going to listen to the acoustic guitar. I'm going to listen to." I these. bet he picked it up and started searching. Is what and, happened. Or, yeah. Right, and then he yeah. found it. and He goes like, "Oh man, that's bad." And then he, you know, but they didn't hear it on stage. Hmm. And so it was just crazy. Hey, Jody, if you're out there, we love you. And it was, it ended up being a great show and a great recording. We got some of those stuff, that's some of the stuff on YouTube, but it was super complicated. Oh, I bet. Um, and, uh, yeah. and it cost, it cost a lot of money to have all those people in place working. So it's one of the decisions artists have to make is, you know, what do I spend my limited capital budget on this year mm-hmm. for for content production and a lot of the artists have so many if they're really prolific songwriters they always want to get that song they just wrote last week down on a new record and the idea of going and spending instead of doing that spending money on on recording a live show of songs that i've been doing for the last couple years you know I, i don't blame them for wanting to get the new stuff out yeah so do you still go listen to live music to capture new talent? I do. I just went to <laughs> see uh, the youngest artist on my roster, and maybe not the youngest age-wise, but the newest roster on my uh, newest artist on my roster mm-hmm. is this kid named Hayden Woolen um, out of Dayton. He's a soul singer. Now cool. he does a lot of country songs, yeah, uh, Waylon and stuff like that but he his singing his performance is is a soul really uh, bluesy soul very very different approach than most of the artists i work with or that i even go to hear and he he played at that thirsty parrot last night um and uh, he just formed a, he formed a full band it's really important in this industry that you can tour as a full band sure. because you can play the bigger venues <clears throat> and it's just a much better show uh, now right. he's really a great solo player and i've gotten him a lot of shows which is him and his guitar he plays a nylon string guitar uh, like a like classical that one there, right. classical Classic type, yeah and uh, but his his every place i've sent him the venues call me like doesn't happen often i've had a couple of venues call me the next morning he was great we want him back usually i got to call them and say like how was he yeah when can we get him back there so well, they're when coming they to call you. me, and mm-hmm. it might be an email, yeah, not a, a phone thing. call. It's like, wow, well, <clears throat> he's lighting a bottle. And uh, I just went to see him last night for the first time with his full band, and it was great. So he's he's got a really bright future ahead of him. Yeah, I, I go out all the time. Ideally, I'm not having to go halfway across the state to see somebody because I like sleeping in my own bed Sure. Um, these days. I don't know how some of these kids... They, they love being on, the, you know, it's the whole thing about being on the road again. Mm-hmm. Um, they love it. And I always ask them, I go, like, if we do this now, because a lot of them end up playing a lot around their hometown. And one mm-hmm. of the goals is don't play your hometown. Once, we, we need to get to the point where you, you're not playing your hometown more than a right. few times a year, you know. 
and at some of the better venues. You can't get there overnight. So they start out there generally playing every weekend close to home. And I don't care how much you love somebody's music, you're not going to go hear the same artist play the same songs every weekend. Right. So you can't really grow a fan base just playing around the Houston yeah. market. You can't you make a fan base out. out of a little bunch of groupies. That's right. So, uh, so I, like, ideally, um, I don't have to go too far to hear them. And then, but yeah, they, uh, they, lo- they, if if they're going to make it in the industry, they have to embrace the idea of being on the road a lot, a lot of driving, sleeping in, cheap oh ho- yeah, sleeping in cheap hotel rooms, mm-hmm. and uh, it's a young man's game. It's a young man's game, and if they're like. That sounds great to me. I'm like, okay, well, that's 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 one of the check boxes we were talking about before. Mm-hmm. Is like, uh, there's so many things that go into being <clears throat> successful. You don't have to have every single one of those twenty boxes checked, but it would be nice if you had more than half of them checked. Yeah, I can dig it. So, so let me ask you this: it sounds like a dream job. I mean, it's it's got to be a great job. You get to listen to music, deal with artists, you get to help people. But what's the one thing you hate about it? It's got to be something that just sucks. You know. Well, I, the part I, I dislike the most is, is having to say no to artists that approach me and ask me to help them. I can't mm-hmm. help everybody um, because there's only so much time in the week. And right. if, I, if I took on every artist that uh, approached me, I could have... And I'm not bragging. I'm I'm saying they, there's a lot of artists out there that are really talented that really do need help, and they need to find somebody to help them. I'm just one of many people out there. If I if I took on every artist that has approached me for help, I'd have so many artists on my roster. From the outside looking in, they think like, "Wow, you're a huge success. You've got all these artists." The problem is, there's not enough time in the the week to help all of them, yeah, so you, you gotta, end up failing all of them. Right. If you take on too too many, so that's the tough thing is saying no to people. Are you at your saturation level right now? For I'm always at my satura- saturation <laughs> level because I'm kind of working six to seven days a week. Yeah. Now, luckily, I work from home. But recently, and I can get up from my desk anytime I want and walk the dog or go for a run. I'm a runner. Nice. Or. Um, uh, which is why I named it Marathon Music Group, um, or uh, you know, go grab lunch with my daughter, mm-hmm. or uh, do whatever. Um, so that's great. But yeah, I'm I'm really busy, so I'm kind of near my sat- saturation level. And there's so many artists I wish I could work with, but I can't work with all of them. So that's kind of a drag. There's the other part that I don't like is there are some venue owners out there that. And I don't really fault them for this because maybe it's a tough business being a venue owner. But some of the venue owners don't always have the artists, you know, aren't as considerate of what the artists are trying to do with their careers, you know. Yeah, and they're just looking at their bottom line. And they all need to look at their bottom line. Look, we don't want any of these venues to go out of business. But there, there are some venues out there that are very careful with their bottom line, but they're also very gracious hosts mm-hmm. to the artists. They, they, I always ask, can we count on you giving the artist a meal when they get there? Mm-hmm. And most of them are sure, of course, we always feed the artists. Others are like, we'll give them, we'll give them 20% off the menu item, mm-hmm. or they get one drink. Now, not, I don't work with artists that have substance abuse problems so i'm not talking about these artists need to drink a bunch but the artists are eking a lot of them are 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 eking by trying to get to make a living sure they're trying to save their money to make their next record that's a tough tough business and uh and uh the thought that they would have to at the end of the night close out a tab with the money that they're getting paid to perform just bothers me sure makes sense Uh, so I ask if you, you don't have to give them an open tab, but could you at least, uh, if they're going to be performing for two or three hours, can you give them the equivalent of three or four beer bar tab? Can we give them a, a $50 food and beverage tab? Yeah. And that doesn't go very far these days. I don't know if you've gone out to eat lately, <laughs> yeah. but. Just yesterday yeah. and it was right. a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'd like them not to have to dig into their, 
there's that old Blues Brothers movie, right? Where they yeah. go, they play that country western bar, and they're supposed to. I think they're supposed to get paid five hundred at the end, dollars mm-hmm. at the end of the night, and they're presented with a seven hundred dollar <laughs> bar tab. <laughs> right. And uh, John That's Belushi right. says, uh, "Oh yeah, let me go out to the parking lot and." Uh, Grab pass my, around yeah. a collection I'll get the band to pay for that bar tab and instead they dr- have to drive <coughs> what a great movie so yeah do any of your artists do the song Rawhide speaking of Blues Brothers no but they they, <laughs> they should. should they should uh, I did request of Lance Woolley who's the front man for the Hogleg band out of Baton Rouge <clears throat> I uh, uh, there is a new uh there's a new app that's being developed for artists um, called Tipsy that allows them to preload all the songs that they do. And there's one of those QR codes that they bring to the show. And you, as a fan in the audience or as a, as a patron of the venue in the audience, you can go up that QR code and it'll pull up a web page and allow you to scroll through all the songs. Our, and, our friend and, Ryan Pinnock does Ryan that. Ryan Pinnock, yeah. yeah. And, and request a song. <clears throat> And you, you have to pay a tip mm-hmm. to, for the artist to play that song. But it also has a box where you can fill in any song if you want to request a song and how much you'll pay if they'll <laughs> sing it. At least try. So, so I had to request uh, <laughs> of Lance to sing Stand By Your Man. Oh, no. By who who did Stand By Tammy Cassie Wynette. Klein, Tammy, or Tammy Wynette. Wynette. Yeah. 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 So he didn't know it, but he la- I could <clears> see him laughing. He was reading on his cell phone. When he started laughing, I realized he'd gotten to my request. Mm-hmm. And he knew it was me because you have to put your first name. So he goes, Chuck, I'm going to do a different <laughs> Tammy Wynette song tonight. But I promise you, next time you come out and see my show, I will play Stand By Your Man for you. So um, <laughs> can I go ahead and collect the tip? No, I said, sure. <coughs> anyway, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, and I hadn't heard of that app yet, but that sounds like a pretty good yeah, idea. It's, it's, Especially it's, for independence. Mm-hmm. You know, because those guys barely make it by i know ryan pinnock's working all the time you know and people less and less people are carrying cash around these days mm-hmm. and uh, everybody's getting much more comfortable with apps and stuff right. like that so it's, right. it's it's a good timing for this easy for them yeah. and works for him too yeah. so where do you see marathon going i've often thought about that there's some um you know my people that have been in the industry a lot longer than i have um I'm, I'm, I'm kind of fighting the, um, the route of, of becoming a really big booking agency. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's some really big, there's some great booking agencies out there and, uh, uh, you tend, I would need to bring on more staff, train more people. Sure. Um, I could continue to add our, if the thing that keeps me from adding more artists is the manpower. I don't have enough manpower to take on any more artists. Carly coming on board helps a little bit with that. She's, I have uh, uh, one of the most talented and seasoned artists on my roster is, is a guy named Will Carter. I don't know if you ever heard of Will Carter, but he's got a few albums out. He's, he's got an incredible performance and uh, uh, he's, he's far enough advanced in his career that he can afford, you know, he can afford and he needs really more people working for him so we've got Carly doing his booking and I'm doing his management which is the first time I've had the luxury of being able to split those two functions across two people and that's kind of the direction I see that going in is I can add more value for these artists um, the managed artists by being able to cover Mm -hmm. those things I tend to work on the more strategic stuff and I like that because the management stuff is that you're doing something. You, you probably have something in your life that you can relate to on this. Where every morning when I sit down at my desk after I've had my coffee, I got to figure out okay, what are all the things I need to get done that are timely? Like I, I can't procrastinate on these these things right. I need to do, but I don't have to do them today. These things all need to get done today, and how do I prioritize those and get those done efficiently so I meet the needs of all the artists? But every day that list is a little different. So every day I'm doing different things. I may come back. That may be the same set of 40 things I do, but I don't do all 40 every day. I kind of do um, some little graphic design work on posters to put on social media one day, mm-hmm. which kind of 
scratches my my creative side. Um, I may need to do some research on music. Um, I'm almost always listening to music while I'm working. Okay. I'll, uh, uh, finalizing contracts on some festival shows, things like that. Mm-hmm. Got to do accounting work. Um, I'm kind of like the quarterback for publicity and radio promotion and social media, so I may need to reach out to some of the other team members, make sure we're still on track for this release deadline next week, make sure all the pieces are in place. And uh, Carly's focused on the more tactical job, job of contacting venues every day to keep the calendar filled of shows. Because we don't, you know, we're probably working on July and August shows right now. Mm-hmm. Even got some in for September and October on the books. So that's kind of see the direction I'm heading in. I, I don't really want to go the direction of just becoming a pure booking agency, which I could do, because mm-hmm. I've got I've got a really great database in place. <clears throat> because of my corporate background, I went immediately to the idea of I've got to put everything into a relational database, so sure. I can I can say tell the database I want to see all the venues that I haven't contact contacted in the last three months that are in West Texas. And I need to reach out to them because it's time for some of these artists to get back out there. And boom, they all pop up. And then I can write a template email mm-hmm. and select the ones I want to contact and hit send and, and blast them all out with essentially the same message. We haven't been out there in a while. It's time sure. to come back. So I could go that route and, <clears throat> and focus on the booking side. But that's some to me, that's such a repetitive kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. It's very tactical and it's not very long-term thinking um so uh i probably won't go that route um, still sounds like growth though yep you know so, i don't think you're going to be able to escape it no you know so uh i want all the artists on my roster to achieve their dreams and uh be able to make like i said they just want to make a living at this mm-hmm. they don't want to have to have a second job necessarily um most of them do because they're at the phase where they can't get by with just the music right. career. But it's possible that they could get to the point where they're touring enough and they're getting paid enough per performance um, that that becomes their job and they, they're able to pay all their bills and they're very, they're very happy. I'd, I would look all my artists to get there. But in terms of my business, if I think about my business, uh, it would also, you know, if one of the artists becomes the next Cody Johnson. Never know. Um, that would be really thrilling, too, sure. just to have one. Um, Kate Watson's on my uh, roster right now. She was an American Idol contestant a couple of years ago. She just turned 21 a few months ago. Didn't she just? Ago. I've got her hat. I've got Kate. Kate, if you're watching, i got your. I'm sporting the I believe KW. Kate Watson today. just won the... Um, Artist of the Year for yeah, she, Texas Radio. She, she was nominated for a new female artist of the year. Um, and when we that was in March, the uh, Texas Regional Radio Music Awards. And she was nominated for that award. She didn't win that award, but she got in a lot of recognition for just being nominated for, it, considering she's so young and just getting started. But she did go up. We did go up the, the night before the awards, and they had a, a special event called the Future Faces Show, and they basically had 10 artists that were essentially just getting started, and uh, they did two sets of five on stage, and those mm-hmm. five, the first, Kate was in the first group of five, and there was guys and girls, and they, they did what we call a song swap. They each took a turn doing an original song, and they each got to do three songs, so they went around the circle three times. Mm-hmm. We heard 15 original songs by five very young artists. Uh, and then they took a break and we, they did brought five more artists on stage. And these are solo, just the them and their guitars. And uh, wow. Kate, then there was voted. There was a packed house. There's a lot of people there all up to see the awards and they did a, a vote. And she, uh, there were five guys and five girls total. And she won the female uh, artist award and was able to perform on stage the next day during the award show and if you imagine the award show it's like the Grammys oh I'll bet 
except a lot more cowboy boots mm -hmm. and cowboy hats in the audience than you'd ever see at the Grammys because it's the Texas country music awards. Sure. Um, and she got out there and she blew the place away. So she's headed for Nashville to record her debut album. She's been very, uh, because of her talent and her, she's just got a, she's just a great person too. She's just mm -hmm. a real sweetheart. Um, she's got a lot of recognition and she's getting a lot of support now has come in to help her she's going to nashville she's going to start recording her debut album and it, i know it's going to be phenomenal uh she's got a great family her dad's been in music his whole life he's the mm -hmm. uh, music director at the lone star cowboy church in montgomery okay and he's a songwriter too and the two of them collaborate on almost all of her songs and she's got a really great video producer if you check out her videos you'll see that they're really well made um so yeah, she's gonna be she's gonna be a she's gonna be a big thing. Real That's soon. gotta warm your heart to see yeah. somebody yeah. come up like that that you helped out. Yeah, absolutely, it's gonna be great. So. so how can people get in touch with Marathon? Well, Marathon Music Group. Just go. You can go to the website or my Facebook page. Reach out to me there. There's a there's a way to link to me there. Um, okay. I I love talking about the business. I could t I could sit here for hours and talk about how the music business works and the, how rewarding it is to be involved in it and be able to help young people. Um, and um, I'm always happy to give advice. I give a lot of, for what it's worth, I'm not an expert by any means. There's people that have been in this business a lot longer than me. But uh, I may not have any room on my roster, but I still am um, available to give some of my time um, and guidance to people if they want okay. uh, to call or email me. Fantastic. Well, that's good. Mark, got anything else? Chuck Sweeney, Marathon Music Group. And uh, performer with the Reverb Cartel. Yes. <laughs> come out if yeah. you want to. Say hey to Eric see. for us. He's where's where's Reverb playing at next? Do you know? We're playing at uh, the Thirsty Parrot in Hempstead on May 28th. Okay. And then we're playing, I want to say it's the first Sunday in June at the Typhoon Texas Water Park in Katy. They've done that before. Wow. And we've played that before. That's a hot show because it's at like hot not only because we're a great band <laughs> but hot because it's probably going to be about 95 degrees. That's, yeah. that's, that's right time. around the corner from my house and I was thinking how the hell is that going to work? And the way the, <laughs> the stage faces the wave pool and the sun faces the stage so like we're pretty much in the sun there so mm. but they they're really Tough. great they're really great people there and they give us plenty of cold water and we take some breaks and we have a lot of fun uh it's great don't yeah. miss we do Chuck we, Sweeney. we do all classic rock so if, uh, in particular come see us if you if uh you have a pension for 70s 80s and 90s uh classic rock music you're going to recognize every song that we play mm -hmm. you know a lot of tom petty and pink floyd and Right. Um, all that kind of stuff. All the so, good stuff. That's right. Yeah, we do actually put a little promo on Hank's Think Tank on uh, on Facebook that was y'all's little promo video. Oh, great. Yeah, it was awesome. Oh, thanks. So, we had fun yeah. making that. Yeah, and the video was great, too. Yeah, it really, worked. really well done. Yeah. What yeah. kind of harmonica is that you're playing? So uh, I have a bullet mic, uh, which is this blue bullet-shaped mic, which really gives you that that bluesy gritty thing yeah. and then mm -hmm. i also have it eq'd i have the and i learned all this by watching youtube but uh, i have the the highs taken out and the mid dropped about halfway and the bass boosted so if you looked at the eq curve it'd be real boosted in the mm -hmm. in the bass area and then it drops off and there's hardly any highs there and then i'm i have an a b switch because i can't play harmonica and guitar at the same time it's, but i run them both through my uh fender tweed Deluxe, okay. and uh, so I have, an cool. AB, I have an AB switch. I switch between the two of them, and then uh, the, the harmonicas are what I learned from harmonica. I'll tell you a little thing about harmonica playing. I was when I was 22, and I just got out of school. Um, I wanted this cover band I'd just formed to be like that was the most important thing in my life. But I was starting a job, and I was a route salesman driving all over South Central Texas, calling on HEBs. Oh, wow. And uh, they were headquartered in Corpus at that time. And I had moved to Corpus, didn't know a lot of people there, and I spent almost all my time on the road going to all these stores, making sure they were stocking the products 
that I've represented. And I really wanted to take my new guitar. I just bought a 1981 um, Les Paul Custom Cherry okay. Sunburst. <clears throat> nice. And I still have that guitar. It's a, I bought it brand new. I had, I took my first paycheck and I put $200 towards it on layaway because I couldn't like walk in and just buy it. And I eventually got it out of layaway and I've had it ever since. But I didn't want to take that on the road with me because it's so hot. I didn't want to have to leave it in the car. I didn't want right. to leave it in a hotel room. Yeah, it wouldn't I be was, good. I, and I thought like, uh, and I haven't had an acoustic guitar, but I didn't want to do that to the guitar. And it occurred to me, it's like, you know, I really wanted to learn to play harmonica too. And I realized, you know, you can't really damage a harmonica in a hot car. And a harmonica is probably the only instant probably one of the only instruments you can imagine that you can actually play while you're driving a car yeah so true yeah. i made a bunch of cassette tapes of rock and blues songs that had harmonica on them and i would put that i'd be on the road for an hour or two at a time and i'd pop that in the car and i'd try to learn i discovered you got to have a different harmonica for, for each, each key for each key <laughs> that you're playing in so right. I eventually but i bought really cheap you know there's really cheap like at the time they were like right. five dollar harmonicas right yeah. and eventually they, they they'd wear out and stuff and so now mm -hmm. luckily i can afford i buy these uh suzuki harmonicas they're made in japan they can they're make of, everything over there and uh Almost. and uh, they cost literally 70 or 80 dollars a piece mm -hmm. but i haven't broken one yet like i've had them for a couple of years and they just sound really good they're mm -hmm. easy to I, I took one of the cheap ones and one of the good ones and when you blow through this yeah, one it can, feels like it's clogged the mm -hmm. cheap one feels like it's you can hardly get relative you, i didn't realize it until i did the comparison test mm -hmm. the other one's really easy to blow through you can breathe easier and not faint after the, by the end of a song mm -hmm. and uh the reeds must be made better because they eventually the reeds will begin to wear out and then you you got notes you can't blow anymore they're just not there they're dead and then you got to right. throw the harmonica away and buy another cheap one or upgrade to a really good one and it lasts so anyway cool so. well i look forward to hearing you guys again it's been a while so yeah that'd be great come out and hear us appreciate you coming on the show thank you it's thanks for wonderful. having us and uh, yeah, picked up a lot about the music business. Thank and you, Marcus. How this has been a real pleasure changed. talking. It's I been love, great, love Chuck. Talking to y'all, we're yeah, looking yeah, really forward good. to having Please, you. Please uh, check out the artists um, that uh, Marathon represents and come see those artists. They're really, really talented artists. Check out their music. You'll find them all on Spotify. Okay. Uh, you can <coughs> download their one sheets if you're looking for. Uh, entertainment for your venue or for a private party or for a wedding we can do these artists will do acoustic solo duo trio f great full band shows they'll bring all their own sound and lights if they need to and you won't be disappointed in, in the music that they deliver so everything so, right at your okay. fingertips at marathonmusicgroup.com there you go check it out guys all right well there you have it uh, the music business has changed but it's still music so it's got to be good and uh, I'm Hank Vatt for Mark Hogan. This is Hank's Think Tank, and we're out.